Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Talis. Um, I'm a clinician scientist at Moonfield Thai Hospital. Um, I would like to thank uh, the Macro Society for inviting me uh, for this talk today. And I'll be talking about uh, cone uh, slash rod dystrophies. Uh, and I have yet to um, clarify what the difference is and uh, how we can identify each. And sometimes, uh, understandably, it's a uh, it, it's it, there's a lot of difficulties to define exactly what is what and they may overlap so let's try to go through this now so um when we think of inherited retinal diseases this is a big umbrella term uh, and it means many things right and this is a way to put them into a spectrum of diseases which are inherited in nature now these diseases they are heterogeneous in nature meaning that they um uh, they vary age of onset, they vary the symptoms, uh, they vary the genetic mutations that we find. So these are pretty much different diseases. <clears throat> they have a different course as well. So it's not uh, uh, only age of onset, but also so the age where the disease shows, but also the progression of the disease. Now, uh, um, mostly they are symmetric uh, uh, abnormalities. These are bilateral, uh, but in most cases they are symmetrically. Uh, there are some slight asymmetries that you may see in some retinal district and in some are you know it's more frequent than others to have this asymmetry uh, but mostly these are symmetrical diseases so you would expect that the same deficit that you have on one eye you're also going to have in the next eye as a group of conditions right this umbrella term again of genetic disorders that affect the retina uh, and are inherited in nature uh, the prevalence the estimated prevalence is around one to three thousand individuals it is the leading cause of blindness, uh, legal blindness uh, amongst the working age adults. So it's, it's not uh, as rare as we think it is. It's actually rather common. Um, and it's the second uh, form of legal blindness in children. Um, there are plenty of modes of inheritance that you can get this. Uh, essentially, you can get this in a dominant form where you only need one copy of a mutation on a gene that comes either from your mother or your father. In a recessive manner, which you need a double dose coming from your father and your mother, which can be linked to the X chromosome as well. So women uh, are typically uh, carriers and they may develop some symptoms or some signs in the rest, but usually they are just carriers and they don't, they don't, they don't have symptoms. Uh, and then the mitochondrial inheritance is an uh, inheritance that comes from the mitochondria uh, and passes uh, uh, through the females in the family to the, uh, to the uh, offspring. Now, uh, when we, so if we think of inherited retinal diseases as a group of diseases, right, as an umbrella term, we get the cone and the cone rod dystrophy. Now, these are diseases that affect the light sensitive cells that we have in our eyes. And we're going to be talking about pretty soon about that. But in terms of uh, its commonality, of course, it's not as common as the big group because that's a subsection of the group. Should I say a subgroup? Uh, and the estimated prevalence of this is one to 20,000 to 100,000 uh, uh, in the population. Essentially, this can be divided in stationary and progressive. And typically, again, because uh, this is not, uh, uh, this is medical sciences, they, they, we don't have really uh, much pattern, but these are usually congenital with an early infantile onset or poorly congenital in nature. And uh, um, uh, usually the stationary diseases may only affect one of these uh, systems. When we think of progressive, we're usually talking about a little bit of a later onset uh, and they may have rod involvement. Now, you know, this will change because I'll show in the next slide how we think about this. So this is when I see patients, and this is for all the doctors that deal with patients with inherited retinal diseases, this is what going through our minds. I try to put this in a way that, you know, makes sense. Uh, but when, when we are thinking of inherited retinal diseases, uh, you can essentially divide that into stationary and progressive and uh, into rod, cone, rod, cone, cone rod, call your retinal dystrophies and macro dystrophies. Essentially, uh, when it's stationary and you have rod dysfunction, the first thing that comes to mind is congenital stationary blindness, which is the most common. Then you may also have stationary cone dysfunction syndromes like achromatopsia and blue cone monochromatism. Achromatopsia is, again, much more common. Uh, and when we're thinking of progressive retinal dystrophies, this is, I think, 
uh, where the difficulty comes, you can either have rod cone dystrophies, cone and cone rod dystrophies, which are usually isolated in the cones, or they overlap frequently with some findings in the light sensitive in the rod light sensitive cells as well, uh, or they can be on the back parts of the eye, and they can affect the central part of the retina as well, right? And the macular dystrophies are really common. That's not exactly the subject of this, but I just thought I would mention it. So the way that we see, right, and that's on that uh, on that figure there, is that the light comes, the photons of light come inside the eye. They cross the entire media of the eye, which is usually a transparent media, you would expect. Uh, and then they hit the photoreceptors on the back part of the retina, which is to the right of the image there, on the very back part of the retina. Uh, this unleashes a cascade of events, okay? And this information gets sent to the inner layers of the retina, which are then sent in the form of electrical impulses for the brain to interpret. So this is usually how we see. When we're talking about stationary retinal dysfunction syndromes, for example, you would say congenital stationary night blindness, this is on the inner section of the retina. So it's further down the pathway of vision. Uh, and when we're talking about progressive retinal dystrophies, these are usually on the first part of, of the processing, the, the processing of the photons of light. Now, uh, and I think this is the, I thought I would just do something a little bit different instead of just showing cases, I could just uh, perhaps uh, teach you the right mindset to think of what exactly it is, right? And how to name this correctly. And trust me, the naming convention is, is, is really difficult because they frequently overlap. So you may think it's isolated in cones, but then uh, later down the line, one, two years, you do uh, some further tests and you see that the rods are also affected. But what are cones and rods, right? These are the light sensitive cells that we have in our retina. So these are what capture the photons of light and start the processing of this information, right? Cones are more numerous in the center of the retina. We have around 4.6 million cells. Uh, we have three types uh, of opsins. We have the long, which is the red pigment, the medium, which is the uh, 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 green pigment, and the short wavelength, which is the blue pigment. Now, uh, these opsins are pigments that are present within this cone. So we have essentially cones with all of these three uh, separately, uh, uh, opsins, pigments, and they are responsible for a different, um, uh, they capture a different section of the wavelength. So they capture different colors. That's how we have color vision. Now, uh, cones also give you a high spatial resolution. When we think about rods, it's the other way around. There's only one opsin. So these are achromatic, meaning no color. That's essentially what that word means. And the pigment is called rhodopsin, which you may have heard. Uh, they are much more numerous than cones. We have 92 million cells. And we have a specific se section in the center of the retina, which is rich in cones and has absolutely no rods. We call that the rod-free zone. Um, so they have a higher sensitivity to light than cones. And then uh, we use them a lot for night vision. That's when they are mostly activated. And they have a poor visual equity. They don't, they don't uh, give you enough resolution to give you a good uh, visual equity. Now, so we know what these two cells are. How can we differentiate whatever is cone dysfunction, whatever is rod dysfunction? So we have to think of what they do, right? And uh, cones, again, they, they give you color, they give you spatial resolution, they give you central vision. So the symptoms of cones are related to their function. So reduce central vision with nystagmus, which are these eye movements. Usually they're back and forth eye movements that some patients have. That's because of the lack of fixation that patients have or the lack of, um, uh, of good central vision. Uh, color vision difficulties and increased light sensitivity. Okay, the cones are not working. You tend to have, uh, uh, we call it photo aversion. It's aversion to light, right? When you have symptoms of rod dysfunction, you have night blindness plus or less constriction of visual field. We tend to, uh, uh, we thought that the visual field, the, the, the light sensitive cell is responsible for visual fields are the rods. Uh, that's not exactly how it works. So the cones give us spatial resolution as well. What happens is that when you have rod diseases, the rod produces a specific substance that's essentially called a, a survivability factor for the cones. 
Uh, so if you don't have the rods producing this substance or this molecule, the cones will not survive. Now, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is important because there's a specific gene therapy that's um, in a very early st stage by starting in, in humans using this specific rod derived uh, factor. So it's very interesting because it's uh, it's gene agnostic, meaning you don't you don't need a specific gene uh, genotype to be uh, to be eligible for this gene therapy, and it's the only of its kind. So. Um, in terms of stationary disease, let me just show some images and put uh, that big mind map into some bullet points to make it a little bit easier. So uh, when we think of cone dysfunction, these are the main three diseases that we can think of, right? And these are stationary diseases. So achromatopsia, blue cone, monochromacy, and oligocone trichromacy. Now, the first image on the on on the um, up up there on the right, uh, it's it's a fundus image of a patient with achromatopsia, and a tomography, which is the typical uh, B scans that you have when you come to clinic when you when you go see your doctors, and you just have to trust me on this. It's essentially it's a normal uh, uh, retinal architecture on the very central part of the macula. What you have is that you have a disruption in the layers that represent the photoreceptors. But otherwise, it's a very normal looking retina. And then you also have the rod dysfunction uh, stationary diseases, right? And the most common by far of these is congenital stationary blindness. Uh, Funus albunctatus is rare. And Noguchi disease is so rare, I've never even seen one. Uh, I, I've seen photos, but I have never even seen a patient with that. Now, uh, congenital stationary blindness, these patients usually have a very normal looking retina. If we think again of how we see things, um, the photons of light come to the back layers of the retina and then it comes to the inner segment. The uh, uh, congenital stationary blindness is an inner retinal disease, so it's further down the path. You wouldn't expect to have any any uh, issues in the how in the structure of your retina. Uh, in terms of progressive retinal dystrophies, and I think this is where the confusion uh, starts, is uh, you can differentiate this in, into the system that it affects your eyes, right, essentially. So you have rod cone dystrophies, uh, like liver congenital amaurosis, early onset severe retinal dystrophy, and retinitis pigmentosa. So retinitis pigmentosa is a type of rod cone dystrophy, but not the only rod cone dystrophy that a patient can have. That's the first distinction, because... Uh, patients say, oh, uh, my doctor told me that I had broad cone dystrophy. Oh, that's correct. Uh, but if you want to be a little bit more accurate, it may, it's, it's retinitis pigmentosa is the name of that. Or it can be the other way around. Uh, you told me I had retinitis pigmentosa. My doctor said I, I had broad cone dystrophy. It's the same. It's just that broad cone dystrophy is a large group, larger group of conditions. Um, so you can also have cone, so isolated cone dysfunction syndromes. And this is uh, rare. But there are some genes that cause isolated um, uh, cone dysfunction syndromes. And then you have cone rod dystrophies. Most of the cone dystrophies, they at some point in the disease, they become rod dystrophies as well. So you have some symptoms uh, or you have some uh, affection in the rods as well. Um, so, you know, they typically overlap. And this also generates a little bit of confusion. Then you have the chororetinal dystrophies like coronary majority atrophy. These are on the very far back sections of below the retina, almost. Okay, um, and I'm just putting them here to show you what it is exactly. And then you have the macular dystrophies. I didn't even mention it here because uh, macular dystrophies they deserve you know a lecture on its own. Just because well these are Stargardt disease, X-linked retinal schisms, and Bath disease. These are the you know amongst the most common retinal disorders, so we can't really go through that. But just to show this is. The first picture that you see there, that's a typical case of retinitis pigmentosa. And I hope the picture is not too small. But what it shows is that you have this pigment spicules in the periphery of the retina or in the mid periphery, as we say. You have a little bit of a pallor optic nerve, which should be a little bit more color, let's say. Uh, and then you have also some um, uh, constriction in the vessels in the retina. This is a tr triad that makes us think of retinitis pigmentosa. So that's what retinitis pigmentosa is, but you don't need to have that to be diagnosed with a rod cone dystrophy. I hope that makes sense. Um, so just a few selected examples here to show exactly what I mean. This is a cone dystrophy, okay? 
Now, to which level is this isolated cones or cone rod? We need to do some tests. So that's why we do electrophysiology, which is the test that we put the electrodes and measure the response from the eye to the brain. Uh, uh, and then we have to follow up the patient as well because in the first, I don't know, 20 years of cone dystrophy, maybe isolated cones, but then it may maybe that it's a later onset that the rods get affected too. Uh, so this is a typical cone dystrophy first. Okay, and I, I hope you can see that, but it's a bullseye on the left side, the typical bullseye appearance. And when we do a specific test, which is called phonosaurofluorescence, most patients have that in clinics as well, uh, where you use a specific wavelength of light, you use a filter, a blue filter, uh, uh, you get pigmentation in this ring format, which shines brightly, and then you have the central uh, uh, area which may be decreased in terms of fluorescence, meaning that uh, this is a very characteristic finding of that. And then again, it's just to show uh, an example of a patient with retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, on my screen here, uh, for some reason, uh, it looks a bit um, a bit blurry, but I hope you can see it's the same image that I showed before, or a similar one. It's not the same patient. Um, uh, and then you can see the vessel attenuation as well. So reduction in the caliber of these vessels, this bone, uh, we call it bone spicules. Let's just call it pigment spicules because it makes much more sense if you ask me. Uh, and then the vessels are also reduced in caliber. And then this is a patient who carries a gene on the X chromosome uh, that causes retinitis pigmentosa. This is a female patient. So remember that they mostly they don't have symptoms or they don't have anything in the retina. But because of the pattern that uh, uh, females have two X chromosomes and males have one, you have an inactivation of one of the X chromosomes of female patients. And you may have some signs in the retina. So uh, on this image, for example, what you can see is a mosaic of normal and abnormal cells. Uh, this tapeta reflex, as we call, this is very characteristic uh, in patients who are carriers. So even if you are a carrier, it may, may, uh, it may help the physicians, the doctors uh, seeing you as well, because it may provide some answers in the genetic diagnosis. Uh, and this is just uh, choroideremia, just showing how it looks. Uh, you have a preserved central retina with an otherwise atrophic or thin retina. And the, we're not even talking about choroideremia. The reason I'm showing this is because it's cell pattern recognition, right? So uh, this is not something that can be easily taught. And, you know, it makes sense that the patients have difficulties to understand this because some doctors do as well. Uh, but after you've seen this many times, you start to get the pattern of this. This is CRB1 associated retinal dystrophy. So it's, um, uh, it's a severely early onset dystrophy in this case. Um, and again, pattern recognition, you can see that around the vessels, there, there are areas where the, uh, the skin, the ptilin of the retina is somewhat preserved. This is a very characteristic trait of this gene and also this gold reflex in the center as well. Uh, it's very characteristic. Uh, this uh, On this slide here, it's a case of uh, liver congenital amaurosis. And again, it's pattern recognition. So you see these white dots uh, with an otherwise very thin retina. Uh, there's a phenotype that's uh, somewhat easy to uh, uh, make a diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis, most cases, and to extrapolate what gene this would be. And why am I showing all of this, right? And the reason is this gene is called RPA65, and we actually have a gene therapy approved for this. So uh, we can actually do some sort of treatment there. Now, what are your best sources, right, to get uh, in touch with people who are doing gene therapy trials? And sometimes, uh, you know, your doctor will not know every gene therapy that uh, is ongoing. He will know, you know, the, the ones that people talk a lot about uh, and things that have been published, but not everything. So. It, your doctor won't substitute the research that you have to do on your own as well. It empowers you to do that. Uh, this is a, I, I, I don't take any credit for this. This is a guy named Andrew Pano. You can follow him on Twitter. Uh, and he did this very nice graph showing the gene therapy trials uh, that are currently ongoing. This is not an extensive list and it's for a wide range uh, uh, of indications. So you can see Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, retinitis pigmentosa, everything is in there. Uh, muscular dystrophy. So 
I'm just showing this so that you understand that we currently live in the, uh, uh, I would say, from the 2010s to today, or perhaps the next five to 10 years still, we are living in the era of gene therapy. So uh, uh, it's very good to keep up to date because even the genes which are rare, so we don't have many patients affected by it, they are receiving gene therapy too. Your best sources would be the charities, the family support groups, your doctor, and the website lameclinicaltrials.gov, which is, uh, uh, is done by the U.S. National Library of Medicine. So if there's a clinical trial that is just, let's say, uh, worth of knowing about, it will be in clinicaltrials.gov. So places like, uh, um, like Retina UK, Macular Society, Foundation Fighting Blindness, these are very good sources um, um, uh, uh, of new treatments that are coming. And also family support groups. Now, um, there's approximately 300 genes associated with head retinal dystrophy today. This number varies a bit, but it's around that time. It's a lot of genes, right? Uh, most of these diseases caused by mutations on this gene, uh, they are progressive and they may cause severe loss of vision in an early age and no cure is available for any of them. Now, no cure is is different than doing nothing, okay? Uh, I have many colleagues who do not work with genetics and, and uh, very smart people, rats and the doctors, and they used to say, well, now we can finally treat these patients. And it it, you know, it scratches my ear every time I, I hear that because I have been treating my patients throughout my career. Um, so you can offer many things now. You don't need to wait. So patients with light sensitivity, like on dysfunction syndromes, they will benefit from tinted lenses, sunglasses. This will make even their vision go better because the light is affecting what they can see, right? Prescription glasses. Most of these retinal dystrophies are associated with some form of short-sightedness or long far-sightedness. If you don't correct this in an early age, what happens is that the child doesn't develop vision. That's major. Uh, then you can change your healthy habits. You can do uh, a diet that includes, you know, plenty of green vegetables, as you typically see, fish as well, because it contains uh, other things. Uh, and other lifestyle changes like stop smoking. We know that smoking is bad for the retina, right? So it's not only uh, wearing sunglasses for the UVA and UV protection because, you know, uh, the sun rays also damage the retina, but also doing some other stuff like stop smoking, try to keep healthy, as healthy as you can. And one thing I always tell patients is that they can do whatever they want in life. As long as they can navigate through their difficulties, there are some things that they won't be able to do, of course, but neither am I. Right? I wanted to be an air fighter pilot. I can't because my vision is not good enough. That was back then. Uh, so uh, you have to navigate through your difficulties. Uh, and trust me, this empowers you. After you go through that stage, it empowers the patients. And also clinical trials, observational studies. Am I uh, uh, eligible for any of these? Patients want to plan their families. Patients want genetic counseling, right? Uh what are the chances that my child is affected by that? What are the chances that I will be able to drive myself? So some of these also increase your risk of having systemic abnormalities. So some genes which cause retinitis pigmentosa may also cause some syndromic features, may cause kidney abnormalities, heart abnormalities, hearing loss. So these are all things that we need to, to know. And also patients want to prepare their lives. Will I get blind? When will that be? How fast will this progress be? Will I be able to drive? What adjustments should I do in advance? Should I use a mobility aid? Should I learn Braille? Should I get a guide dog? I have seen so many questions about this and all of the answers, they will change depending on the gene involved. Hence, it's like crucial to find a molecular diagnosis because that will help your clinicians help you. So if I had to summarize uh, all of the things that you have heard from me, um, and thank you for bearing with me there, uh, inherited retinal diseases and as a specific topic of this lecture, cone and cone rod dystrophies, they are amongst the most common of CVI registration uh, uh, cases. Uh, and remember that cone, cone dysfunction syndromes, cone rod dystrophies, these are all within this group of conditions. There's a very wide range of clinical findings. So you can uh, have the same mutation uh, that a patient has and have a completely different 
um, um, function of your eyes and it may also look completely different. Uh, they typically involve either the epithelium of the retina, the skin below the retina, uh, or the light sensitive cells, or all together. And they may overlap, so hence it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to make that distinction. Um, there's many new therapies that are ongoing, uh, anticipated to be, uh, hopefully, and that's the optimism in me, uh, uh, saying that uh, we may have some new medications or some new drugs approved in the near future. And it's not all about clinical trials. And that's the, the thought that I'll leave you with. Uh, knowledge of basic disease mechanisms. So preclinical research, animal models, and observational research in humans as well. They will dictate what we are going to do in the future in terms of treatments and in, in terms of patient counseling. So it's very important if you are interested to participate in these observational studies as well, because uh, trust me, we have learned so much from observational studies uh, that these are crucial and they may help develop a treatment in the future as well, although that's not the main point of them. Thank you so much for listening to me. I hope the, the audio was clear and you have a nice day.